We talked earlier about the primary tubing and the secondary tubing. Uh, let's talk about the buretrols. Let's see. Our buretrols are used for the children and the elderly. Buretrols look like this. They've got like a long barrel chamber on it. And these are used for people that you don't want to take the chance of giving them too much fluid because this is like an extra safety device. Oh, I gotta close my clamp before I take my paper pieces off. I always close my clamp. So I'm gonna open one of these for you. And also on your tubing, if uh, most of your tubing comes with little stickers or when you change your tubing, always label your tubing, your primary tubing and your secondary tubing um, so that you'll know when it was changed and when it's next to be changed. Because again, you don't wanna be wasteful with your uh, patient's um, money. So this is what a Buretrol looks like. And again, you mainly see these on children or on infants. Uh, sometimes you may see them on elderly, but for the most part, it is, it is children. So it's built kind of the same way. It's got like a little port where you could inject something into it. That's sort of your vent. But this has got a roller clamp up here and it's got the spike here. So you would spike your bag See, I've got my clamp down here. This adds a little bit of an extra. This is like, you've got your primary bag up here, but this is kind of like another bag. The most you normally put in this is 100 mLs at a time. This is like a sa another like a safety check. You only put like maybe an hour's worth or a couple hours worth of fluids into this so that you don't take the chance of getting busy and running a thousand mLs of fluid into someone and overhydrating them and overloading their system. Let me get a bag. I'll show you. Now this is D10, this is 10% dextrose. You would not give this to a baby. If you have an order to give 10% dextrose to somebody, you need to really be sure that they need it because this is uh, this could uh, not be good for the majority of people. So I'm going to turn it around. Again, it's got a port and it's got the um, little blue port that we're going to spike in front of. I have clamped off my, my roller clamps. Again, on this one, the pump, your pump would go here. I'm going to take my lid off. Again, I cannot touch that spike because it has to be sterile because this is going directly into a baby's body. I'm going to hold it, I'm going to pop it. I'm going to hold it and I'm going to spike it again and then hit it dead on. I'm going to twist it up in there. So this here is essentially, see your drip chamber's way down here where you can squeeze it. So I'm going to let this roll and I'm going to put just 100 mLs in there. It's filling up. Or let's say that I am giving an infant and maybe I just want to put 50 in it, but usually 100 is the most that you want to put in it. But. Let's say that we're going to put 50 in it. Their IV is going at 25 an hour, and I'm going to come back in here and check them in a few hours. So I'm going to put it at about 50. And right there's where you could run your secondary into. You could piggyback into this and put their uh, antibiotic into this. So then I'm going to cut this off because I don't want any more to come down in here. So here's my bag, and then here's like a little second bag that keeps that patient from getting too much. So now I would squeeze my drip chamber because I want to be sure it's dripping. You see? Because here's where I'm going to watch. Hope this is making sense to y'all. So I've got my, maybe two hours worth of medicine in here. I've got my drip chamber. Now I have to prime this set of tubing. So I'm going to. And you can see it's safe. Let's see. It's dripping. I got a little bit too much in my drip chamber. I'm gonna then do it slow. This is really up to this so it may not drip as good. 
Sometimes on these you have to let it shoot out. <laughs> Sometimes you have to crack the seal on this on the end of it. And if you do take this all the way off, you have to be sure that you keep it sterile because you have to put it back in there. So I'm going to put it there. I'm going to show you how fast it comes out. Let's hope it comes out fast. Now, mind you, this is micro tubing, so this is 60 drops. So, see how slow it's going? It's doing small drops. The other one's drip vector was 10, so it came up pretty rapidly. But the Buretrols have got a, a 60 drip vector. So, that's why it's going to take so long for it to come out because we want to be sure that we are not overhydrating. That in this tubing is probably a billion years old. Here we go. So it's dripping out. But remember, on our drop factors on children, we use the micro. So it is a 60 drop factor. Now, I didn't contaminate that, so I can put my lid back on it. Then we would set our pump, so our volume to be infused here would be 35. And our pump would go there. So that is a Buretrol. Again, you use these for children. And I don't have the, I don't have the package over here, but again, the drop factor on it is um, a 60. Now let's look at our Y tubing. Again, our Y tubing is used just for blood with normal saline, 0.9 normal saline. You do not use it with half normal saline. You use it with 0.9 sodium chloride. And this is our Y tubing. And I'm not going to stock it because it's the only set of Y tubing that I have. I just want to show it to you. Because in the hospital, a registered nurse has to be the one that initiates a blood transfusion. They go down to the lab, they uh, check it out of the blood bank, they verify all the paperwork, they bring it back up to the floor, they double check it with another nurse, they go in and check it at the bedside. When a patient's going to get a blood transfusion, they always have on a pink bracelet with a number on it. And that bracelet cannot come off that patient because that verifies the blood they've tested it with. And they have to have a consent for the blood. And the consent, I believe, is good for 72 hours. So uh, depending on your facility protocol, I believe it's 72 hours for a, a blood transfusion. But your blood tubing is good for two units of blood. Again, the art, you're never going to really be the one uh, hanging the unit of blood because a registered nurse has to hang it and the registered nurse has to watch that patient directly for the first 15 minutes of the blood transfusion. After that, the LPN can monitor it, but the uh, RN has to spike and hang it because if most people are going to have a reaction to a blood transfusion, it's going to be in the first few minutes. So, and the Y tubing is just for that very reason. So, okay, it's got paper on it. So, what do we do? close all the clamps. You're going to have a clamp here, then you're going to have two clamps up at the top of the Y. I'm going to take my paper off, but I'm not going to spike it because it's the only set of Y tubing and I had to bum it from the hospital. Or, I take that back, get it donated from the hospital. So, this is my Y tubing. So, before you go get the unit of blood or before the nurse gets the unit of blood, uh, you already have to have their IV and stuff going. You can already have this set up with the normal saline going in. You don't want to go get that uh, blood from the blood bank until everything is going good because the blood is only good for four hours out of the blood bank. So when you come, when the nurse goes to get that blood, they've got to have the IV already started with a 20 gauge or an 18 gauge. They already have the saline going because you don't want to come back what if you get the blood and then your patient don't have an IV and then you can't get the IV and you've wasted that unit of blood. So you always have all of this going or the nurse will have this going beforehand. So this is the Y tubing. Now there's not really any ports up here because you cannot mix anything with blood. They do have a port at the bottom in case you need to flush it with more saline. But the Y tubing is, of course, look at it. It's got the Y. The drip chamber here, you can't squeeze it. Squeeze it, sis. Try to squeeze it. Show my people. It's hard plastic. 
so it will not squeeze like these it doesn't have any elastic so if you try to squeeze it you're going to crack it and ruin it so don't squeeze it it's got the roller clamps and the spike and what you will do is let's put my roller clamps down low on blood We should keep it up off the floor. We'll put it over my shoulder. One of these will go to a bag of normal saline. So you'll have it normal saline. You'll fill your drip chamber. You will flush it and already have this connected to your patient when the nurse goes and gets uh, the blood from the blood bank or the registered nurse. Because again, that's who has to initiate it. So you've got your saline going. Now, when she comes back, this one goes to the unit of blood. You always want to be sure that you close this clamp off before they spike that unit of blood. If not, that blood is going to suck up into that bag of saline. Now, I know this because I have done it. This is lesson learned the hard way. You always be sure that the clamp is off. Both clamps are off when you spike that unit of blood. So, and there's things that have to be timed. When the nurse, when you're doing blood, you have to treat it like a surgery patient. You do a set of vital signs before you start it. You do a set of vital signs every five minutes for the first three minutes, for the first uh, 15 minutes. So it's five, five, five. After 30 minutes, if the patient is stable, you do another set of vital signs in 15 minutes. So you do 15 for an hour. So it's 15 times four. If they're stable after that hour and the blood is still going, it's every 30 minutes. But usually after that, then the uh, blood is usually in by then. So, one goes to the saline, this one goes to the unit of blood, and then the blood goes in. Now, the saline is there as a um, precaution. Now, let's say it all goes well and you're finished with this unit of blood, you would roller clamp it off and turn your saline on while you go get the second unit of blood. They do have a port down here at the bottom in case the patient may need Lasix in between. Um, but for the most part, you do you never inject any medicine when blood is going in. It's really not best practice that you put anything through these, that you have a separate IV line to put any other type of medication. But let's say that you're 20 minutes into a blood transfusion and the patient spikes a fever or they have flank pain and you have to stop that blood transfusion. You automatically, you roller clamp off that blood and you turn your saline on. And yes, the blood that's in the tubing is going to go into the patient, but then you're going to start the saline while you go uh, tell your charge nurse, tell the doctor, and see if that blood transfusion needs to be stopped completely. Of course, when you finish with a blood transfusion, all of the tubing has to go in red bags because it has been uh, contaminated with blood. So that's your Y tubing. That's the only thing you use Y tubing for is a blood transfusion or blood products because if you're doing platelets, if you're doing um, usually albumin, then you want to have this tubing, and this tubing is always a 10 drip factor because it's thick. This, one, this one's 60, the uh, pediatric excess is 60. This one's 10. Your regular uh, tubing is usually uh, 15 to 20, uh, but blood tubing is always 10, and uh, the beer charles are always 60. Again, what goes with normal, what goes with a blood transfusion? 0.9 normal saline. That's the only thing you ever hang with it. And that's your different types of tubing.